Holmes, thanks for taking the time today. We'll start off, uh, let you uh, with an opening statement, and then we'll go to questions. Okay. So, well, I appreciate, appreciate you guys' this time, uh, your coverage of our program, obviously, and uh, specifically with regards to the D-line. You know, we've gotten off to a good dis uh, start, um, I think, defensively this year, and a lot of it has to do with the guys up front. Uh, as I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think we've just got some uh, tremendous young men in our room to work with, guys that uh, have great attitudes, are hungry to be coached, hungry to get better, always trying to improve, and um, you know, just, just a lot of fun to uh, work with these guys on a day-in and day-out basis. The same would be said true for uh, the defensive staff and the guys I work with every day. Um, you know, we've made some good progress, yet we've got four big games ahead of us and we're, we're striving to get better. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do that, take another step this week against Purdue. All right, guys, as you have questions, uh, raise your hand and we'll go through the go through the list. I got I, I got light glaring in my eyes, so I can't see necessarily if somebody's raised their hand or not. So just go ahead and I got start talking. We'll start with Scott Doctor. Okay, ahead, Scott. Scott. Hey, Jay. How you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm doing great. I wanted to ask you about trying to disrupt Purdue's passing attack. Uh, it's been uh, for several years. They've been pretty prolific under Jeff Brom. What are the challenges with that, and what can you do? And is there anything different that you need to do against this team versus maybe a more traditional drop back style of passing? It's hard to get the disruption in from a rush standpoint because they get rid of the ball so quickly. Um, you know, a lot of teams are rushing three guys even and dropping eight into coverage. There's, there's, you know, that's one way to approach it. I think if you can't get disruption in the passing game um, through the rush, then you got to do it through the coverage by getting your hands on people, you know, whether it be in rolled up coverages or press coverages or whatever. But it's a – you know, you can try to blitz them. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, depending on the type of play call that they have and the amount of time the quarterback's going to have to hold on the ball to do it. So, uh, but they're hard to get to. They haven't given up many sacks. Actually, uh, you know, just looking at uh, some of the other teams, um, you know, that we've studied, you know, more of the sacks have come on first and second down than they have on third down, uh, probably when they're getting into some of their play action stuff and they're holding on to the ball a little bit longer. But um, they do a great job. Uh, quarterback O'Connell's playing exceptionally well. Uh, very seasoned player. Understands the system, where to go with the football. I know he had a couple of uh, interceptions up, up at Wisconsin, but that's very uncharacteristic of um, you know how he's played. He's a he's a you know very mature competitor and leader of that offense and has a really good grasp of what he's being asked to do. John Steppy, go ahead. Hey, Jay, good to see you. Good to see you. What have you seen from Ethan Herkett this year? Uh, Ethan's made steady progress. He's done a good job. He had a big sack in the game, um, you know, this past weekend against Northwestern. And uh, he's probably been somewhere in that 20 to 25 snap per game range, which is up, um, you know, a little bit. Of course, he was hurt last year, so, you know, we didn't get to see as much of him. Uh, but he had a good spring a good and a good preseason camp, and he's just kind of continued to evolve and, and uh, trend, you know, on an upward type of a fashion. But uh, super hard worker, uh, physical guy. And um, again, he's just kind of a, a product of, of coming in and working hard every day and doing the things you got to do to, um, you know, to try to make daily improvement through your fundamentals and, and the things that we stress. But um, a lot of that just has to do with his attitude and how he approaches things. Really good kid to work with. Tom Kakert. Hey, Jay. Good hey, to Tom. see you. Good to see um, you, Tom. Wanted to ask you about uh, about Deontay Craig and, and Wyatt Black and, and how they have uh, kind of come on, especially Wyatt coming back from his uh, his injury. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, again, he he was off to a real good start in camp and and uh, early in 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 the beginning of the season, and then obviously had an injury that he had to deal with. But uh, we've we've been able to kind of gradually bring him back. Um, just a few snaps more and more uh, each day in practice and then in games. And it's just uh, a really good uh, bonus, a plus for us to have a body that big on the inside. Uh, just a hard guy to block because of his size, his length. He's also extremely knowledgeable, probably one of the most knowledgeable guys in the room uh, that we have just from the standpoint of, um, you know, having a grasp of, of the X's and O's and what's being asked of him. 
a uh, real good student of the game and, and, a, and another really good guy to coach. But uh, expecting him to get more snaps and just continue to trend upward as some of the rust gets knocked off. And uh, I think he's in a good spot right now, and hopefully we'll have a good game Saturday. Uh, Deontay, uh, kind of like Ethan, and that he's been in that 20 to 25 snap range per game. And uh, he, he's really come on. I think he's made great strides both in run and pass defense. As uh, I've said this before publicly, and I'll say it again, I think he's got a really good knack for rushing the passer, uh, good coordination of his hands and feet, understanding, uh, you know, body uh, position of the offensive lineman that he's rushing and uh, just has a real good knack and feel for that. So uh, hopefully he'll continue. He had a sack Saturday and hopefully he'll continue along those lines and being able to give us good productivity and, uh, and quality snaps uh, as we go through these last four games. Chad likes to go. Chad. Hey, um, wanted to ask about Hercules. Uh, uh, he had the high, Lucas Van Ness had the highest snap count against Northwestern. Um, it seems like with YA back and Aaron Graves playing more, does that, I guess uh, he's playing a little bit more on the edge. Uh, where do you see him having the greatest impact and how can you use him in this last month um, to, your, to your advantage? Yeah, I think probably his snaps inside probably, you know, all things being equal, would have they wouldn't have probably happened had we not had some of the injuries that we were dealing with in there. Uh, third down might be an exception, but for, for uh, the majority of the season, uh, we've used him outside and we'll continue to use him out there. Um, of all the guys in the room, he's got the most, um, probably the best combination, I guess I should say, of, of speed, power, and size, and length, and all the things that we look for out of a defensive lineman. So uh, we just, you know, we'll, we'll rotate him with John and Joe. Those guys have kind of been in, in a three-man rotation with Ethan and, and uh, Deontay coming in after that. But uh, uh, Ethan um, and Deontay are, are doing well, but just probably not getting the same snaps as Joe, John, and Lucas. And I think Lucas will be similar to John and Joe if we can balance that out the way we want to. But um, he can have an impact on the game just because of his explosiveness. Uh, again, be it pass, rush, or run defense. Uh, he's good playing base technique. He's good moving. Um, what, what he needs to continue to work on is just understanding all the, all the little intricacies of the position because like, unlike Joe and John, he hasn't had you know, three years to play out there on the edge. So I think you're just going to see him get better and better as he continues to play out there. David Eichold. Jay, always yeah. appreciate the time. Good to see you. Yeah, David. Um, you know, seven sacks last week against Northwestern, seven different players. You know, even with some of the injuries that you guys have had, it seems like the defensive line as a whole really hasn't missed a beat. Can you just speak to the versatility of that unit and how you guys have continued to just progress and, and keep on that upward trajectory? Because it seems like you can provide so many different looks with the players that you got at your disposal. Well, uh, just a couple things to touch on your point. Uh, and expand on that. I think one of the best things about the seven sack total was, as you mentioned, there were seven different people involved in that. You know, you're going to see games where teams might have seven sacks and one guy might have three or four of them, but this was spread out among the group. Uh, so it's good to see everybody produce. And what we really emphasize in the room is that they work together as a unit. Uh, sometimes a guy's just going to flat out beat somebody one on one. Uh, but more often than not, you've got to have a collective group of four people who are in their rush lanes with right leverage on the quarterback so that when a guy has an opportunity you know, to make a move and, and, and finish a rush that uh, the quarterback's where he expects him to be. So that's something that we've really emphasized um, you know, in, in our four-man rush stuff. Obviously, you know, we had the capability to bring a, a fifth guy or a sixth guy in certain calls, but um, you know, those, those four guys up front have, have done a really nice job working together as a unit. And, um, you know, just if you look back at Iowa football over the years, uh, you haven't seen a lot of major changes with what we do schematically. I know I've been asked about this before. And I think the consistency and the, the way we've evolved um, just with our production and quality of play up front is just a byproduct of these guys doing the same things over and over and over again over the course of not just weeks and months, but in some cases years. Um, if you come out and watch uh, day one practice going into fall camp, you're going to see the same drills being coached at you are uh, the last day of the regular season. It just doesn't change. We got things uh, fine-tuned to 
to where we feel like we know what we need to emphasize and work on as far as how it pertains to our package. And those guys do a really good job working on those things. And that's why those skill sets uh, continue to improve. So hopefully that answers your question. Oh, it's a long answer. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Mm-hmm. Kenny Tin, go ahead. Morning, Coach. Appreciate you taking the time. Sure thing. This, this morning. Wanted to uh, um, ask you a bit of a recruiting question. The coaching staff did a good job of locking up a lot of the 23 class before the season began. I'm wondering, is there an advantage there where maybe you might get a head start on 24 and 25 guys, or has the mentality not changed and you're still primarily focused on locking down the, the rest of the 23 class? Well, I think both things have to happen at the same time, the way recruiting is going on right now. Um, you know, it's it's never just the class um, of the year that you're in, that you're working on. You, you're always working for, you know, the juniors and the sophomores, even in some cases. Um, you, you may not be as long in the, in the relationship uh, with some of those guys because you haven't had the time with them. You may not have had the chance to evaluate them as thoroughly as you would possibly like to. So that's kind of an ongoing process. But certainly we're trying to close out this 23 class and at the same time, I know like for myself, when I go out and watch these games on Friday nights, you know, I'm looking at juniors and sophomores as well. So um, just to sit there and, and uh, I guess kind of um, compartmentalize it into, into one particular class, no, I, I think we're, we're well beyond that and uh, trying to see what's, what's uh, in the next class behind, if not the next two classes behind this 23 class. Scott Dodgman. Yeah, Jay, along those lines, I did want to ask you about recruiting in-state. Uh, is it? How do you feel about your 2023 pledges right now? I know you can't speak to them individually, but and uh, it seems like you've got a really good start in-state with 2024. Uh, is most of the energy now just at least in-state, not about outside the state, mostly focused on building that cohesive bond with the 2023 guys and maybe identified preferred walk-ons? Um, or is that, are there other prospects that you're identifying? Because you've had had a few that have kind of went under the radar that have landed scholarships uh, either late in the recruiting process or spilling over into the traditional signing day. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's all, even in just, if you just take the class of 23, for example, and just look at those guys without respect to the 24s and 25s, even within the class of 23s, there's, there's uh, varying levels of um, the depth of your relationship with the guy, depending on how long you spent with him. Um, again, without naming names, there's some guys in that 23 class. I know that, that I've had communication with, uh, this will be going on three years. Uh, there's other guys who maybe weren't on your radar at that point in time that have have gotten on to it, uh, be it their junior year or maybe even early in their senior year as you continue to evaluate and, uh, you know, talk to high school coaches and things of that nature. So, again, it's an ongoing process. It, it never really stays the same. Um, you know, again, you just have to have to keep your antennas up, your ears open and the thing about guys in the state of Iowa, of course, especially compared to lots of other states where they're playing three and four sports, many of them don't develop um, as quickly because they're, they're doing other things besides just trying to be sports specific and train, you know, weight train and prepare for, for football itself. So uh, you, you have to continue to look, you have to continue to evaluate and see how these guys progress because every year it happens where you've got some guys that come into the picture late that maybe you didn't think would a couple years ago. Okay, I see one more hand up. Uh, John Steppy, go ahead. Another recruiting question. How much has NIL come up from recruits, and has that changed over the last year or so? You know, for me personally, and I don't know what the other guys would say, but I, I have had hardly any questions at all pertaining to NIL. Uh, obviously, we all know what's out there. Um, and, again, that – depending on the program that you're talking about, um, how it's used and, and um, in recruiting and so forth may vary from place to place. But um, for me in, in, in central Iowa and northeast Iowa, I've gotten very few questions that all pertain to that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate your time today. Uh, we'll see, uh, hopefully, ever see everyone over at uh, Purdue on Saturday. Okay. Safe Appreciate travels. it, guys. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Steve. Yep. All good. All good. Yes. Thank you, Coach. Thank you.